a scion of many worlds. Skid away here, Emmanuel answers his communicator as it starts vibrating. You need to get to the heart of the storm. Someone's agitating it and making it stronger. Really? I thought that only happened in cartoons. Apparently not. Well, here starts another story that no one will believe. I'm on my way, he says before ending the call. Someone's making the hurricane bigger, Helen demands, and he nods. Yes. Also, what's cartoon? Think of it like a play. A play performed by switching drawn images so quickly that it tricks the eye and appears to be moving. A bit of sound added to the side and you can get some entertainment, he says and cracks his neck a bit while also stretching the muscles and ligaments that control his proboscis. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to fight both a storm and the person making it stronger. Good to know just where your priorities are, Gertie notes. Yes, stopping emergencies and then returning to diplomacy. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be back in a few minutes. He says before exiting the chamber by crouching to get through the doors. The shuffle down the hallway is uncomfortable and he's grateful to leave the building and stretches out the moment he's out. Crunching down that much is just uncomfortable, a downside to being a titan. His wings spread out and he pulls himself upwards in defiance of non-axiom-based physics and quickly double-checks the location of the storm relative to himself. He nods and secures his communicator on his vest as a body cam. He then flies upwards to where the air grows thin and looks out over the horizon line. The distance is thousands of kilometers away, but he can already see clouds being drawn in by a growing vortex. It's well out of range of even his antenna, but he gets the feeling that he'll be making more use of the ultraviolet and infrared spectrums than normal. Flying in thin atmosphere is very different than flying normally. When the atmosphere's thin, the gravity is generally weak, and if it's not, then you just have another problem to deal with. However, the name of the game is thrust rather than catching air. Now, most would think that this would be an issue for someone with fluttering wings. Designed to beat against the air and provide some lift, his wings are truly terrible for this kind of flight. Which is why he's using them like jets again. Not pulling on air in a mad scramble, but pushing backwards with axiom thrust. The lack of wind resistance is nice and is well worth the slight atmosphere he's basically keeping in his fur to do this without suffocating or having the lack of pressure yank out his eyeballs. He really needs to make a totem to do this for him, though. It's good to be able to do these things, but delegation is king for efficiency. Not good, he notes to himself as he soars well above the growing storm. It's dozens of kilometers across already and growing larger and stronger. He can't see anyone in it, though. Whoever's is kicking things up is not in the eye. He descends into the eye of the storm and reaches out with his antenna. It doesn't improve his ability to sense anything, not really. But it does help him focus somewhat, more psychosomatic than anything. There are things moving in the winds. Unfortunately, the cold air is scrambling what he can make out on the infrared spectrum and the particles in the air are disrupting things on the ultraviolet. He does have their general locations, though. So he closes his much more vulnerable eyes and launches himself into the storm. Worse comes to worst, he can just wholesale disrupt the weather pattern and force whoever's kicking things up to either leave or confront him. He uses his wings more like sails to start riding. His antenna give him a three-dimensional view all around him, and while his wings are a little more sensitive than the rest of him, they're tough enough to let him navigate around with general ease. The first big physical thing flying through the growing winds is a piece of a ship that has clearly been torn away. A sail with a chunk of mast to give it shape. There are no identifying markings on it, so he grabs onto it and rolls the canvas against the mast to give it a tighter profile. He considers letting go of it, so there's one less issue. Then the mental image of him using it as a weapon brings a smirk to his face, and he keeps it. The temperature of the storm starts to shift, 
Whoever's controlling this thing is very much learning as they go. The shifting temperature has other effects, and Emmanuel's antenna grow increasingly more blind as the humidity climbs through the roof and the air starts to turn greasy, which is when electrostatic energy starts building. He has to dive a bit to get to the next big thing in the wind, and it's another bust. A dead sea creature that looks like some madman tried to crossbreed a flying fish with a marlin and gave it a diet of nothing but steroids cut with protein. He mentally dubs the thing a flying spear and slices the fins off it to let the main body fall down as the wings of the corpse fly off into the storm. They might be annoying later, but now there won't be a 10-foot jagged spike in the equation. He wants the storm controller alive. Lacron has had a major brain drain over the generations and someone controlling a weather pattern is the sign that there was someone who won the genetic lottery. Or, even better, someone whose first response after being regenerated to full health was to go out and learn about an immensely complicated scientific field and then proceeded to mold the atmosphere like clay. He wants them. If this kind of thing can be harnessed, then they can end droughts and work as an anti-storm effect on the world. Not to mention this level of axiom control and mastery would... would... His claw meets his face, and he drags IT down. Being disappointed rather than angry is something that often happens when dealing with the incompetent. But when you catch yourself acting like a boob, well, I suppose I was owed an off day, he mutters, before paying attention to what he actually should have been looking at. The person controlling the storm is moving, a great deal, maintaining it and provoking it. Now what's really interesting is that if he's reading the axiom patterns right, they're a Nurthani. This will be interesting. He gives pursuit now that he's no longer wasting time like a complete idiot, and he finds the quicker way is to just unfurl his wings wider than the storm controller can possibly spread her own to ride the winds over. He smacks his mostly withdrawn proboscis to wet his mouth a little and calls out in trill speech, I do declare within this storm that I would like to speak of your intentions, of your actions, and several other things. The humidity and winds are preventing him from seeing her, but he can sense her with axiom easily, and hearing her is without issue. The high tone of trill speech carries very well. It must be said within a storm is a most strange place to speak, be it of intentions of actions, or several other things. The Orthani returns in trill speech. First we will speak of another thing, of tones most deep and Orthani most large. Whom is it that speaks? My name is not within the proper trill. My size is most massive indeed. The deepness of my voice comes from being a male thing. Wet winds bring distraction. I do declare the time has come to speak within the eye. Will you join me so we may speak of other things? Join you, shall I? When we are there, the time will come to speak of other things, of flowing storms, wet winds, and many other things. She answers back, and Emmanuel nods before riding the winds a bit, then pulling on the axiom to reappear inside the eye of the storm. His wait isn't long. The winds outright twist and spit out an Orthani woman. She wears undyed silk that's clearly of her own creation. It's halfway between elegant and tribal, and she easily flutters up to his level. The dampness has pressed down on her fur, and her expression is clearly excited in many different ways. Of things to speak, the first must be of respect. Smoothest silk greets the eartheny king. The eartheny king returns the greetings of smoothest silk and hopes to find understanding with her on some things. He returns with a claw to his chest and a respectful nod. Of storms and winds, great skill is needed to tame both. Will you tell me where you grew this skill, if you care to boast? It would thrill me the most, she answers. On shedding myself, I found myself unchanged in many things. No grander wings or many antenna or a greater proboscis sting. No great wrath within my core or claws with which to stroke. I was unchanged, but still felt something. 
There is no shame to be unchanged. It is the personhood of which the spirits sing, Emmanuel answers, and she flutters happily. I do declare I know it now, but I despaired in the then. So I sought understanding of storms most foul, and have grown without and within. Smoothest silk explains, and he nods. I wish to speak of your learning and perhaps use of such things. The strength and skill to mold the world is a truly mighty thing. He compliments her. Truly? You think it grand? But we did not start this thing, merely move within and stoke the heart, make it beat and sing, she exclaims. To nurture storms and guide its way is no minor thing. But first, we must avoid the danger to others lest we lose control of this thing, he states, and she pauses before nodding. Then watch me grow in strength and skill as I slay this thing, she declares, and flies up as hard as she can before dumping heat into the air around her and causing the air to start to turn against itself. The water, the axiom, and the heat all shifts around in a dance that normally requires numerous scientific instruments to observe, and the show happens right in front of him. Then the storm collapses all at once as it all levels out, and the building hurricane dies, leaving smoothest silk panting in the exertion as Emmanuel flutters up to her level. I invite you now to Aridus Valley to learn of many things. Your skill with storms is great, and to ignore it would be a sin worthy of losing wings, he declares. You would see me as a scholar, as a lady of the tome? Yet the path from Aridus Valley to home is long upon the wing. Such things are of little concern when one can fly swifter than any bird. I will teach you such a method so you can find your way to grander learning and many other things. To fly swifter would be blessing indeed. But does that not need greater and grander wings? Smooth as silk asks him, and he shakes his head. I swept through the skies so swift I could not be seen with eyes, and that was before these things. He explains, gesturing towards his gigantic wings. Small I was then, but swift I still was. Would you care to learn this thing? Yes, I would greatly enjoy this most wondrous of things, she cheers. Of course, in trill speech, the cheer seems at most two syllables long, but that's trill speech for you. Then observe and learn what I do with axiom around my whole self and not merely my wings. He bids her before being as blatant as possible with his axiom use and begins to fly around her as fast as possible. He stays under the sound barrier and she tries to watch him but only succeeds in making herself a little dizzy and losing a bit of height as she gets her head back on straight. Then she lets out an excited bell-like sound and launches herself straight, upwards like rocket. Uh-oh, Emmanuel states and gives pursuit instantly. In moments, she's out of standard atmosphere and passes out in the mid lacran orbit. He pulls her back down into reasonable atmosphere as he places his claw on her stomach to make sure she's suffering no damage. She's thankfully unharmed, and he mentally notes to make sure she gets a galactic standard education as well. Flying out of the atmosphere of one's homeworld is generally a bad idea, especially if you don't have the Axiom Techniques spacesuit or spaceship needed to actually survive it. Still, he descends as she slowly rouses herself, and the now calmer but still swift sea winds dry their fur. Perhaps you should not leave behind all the air you need to breathe and fly within? He asks her gently. How did... Is it not everywhere? It is not. Something more for you to learn? He says. Oh. She says gently as she blinks a few times. I feel odd. Low atmosphere can do that if you are not prepared. He says. I see. 